and the calcium level is normal or elevated. Again, this is because the glands are no longer sensing what the calcium level is, so the calcium may be high, and the uh, feedback mechanism is destroyed, so the parathyroid hormone isn't uh, decreased in response to the elevated calcium. Similar to primary hyperparathyroidism, the treatment for this is surgery. And note, obviously, with all three of these, the parathyroid hormone is elevated as these are three forms of hyperparathyroidism. It's all about what the calcium is doing. So most commonly, we see primary hyperparathyroidism. Again, the etiology is about 80% single gland disease or an adenoma and 20% multi-gland disease. This is 15% have four-gland hyperplasia and 5% have multi multiple adenomas. Also, parathyroid cancer uh, is very, very rare, fortunately, and less than 1%. Um, but you do suspect parathyroid cancer if the patient presents with a calcium greater than 14, or well, certainly if they have a palpable neck mass. The workup for primary hyperparathyroidism is extremely important, and mainly the takeaway is that you want to get a biochemical diagnosis first. So that includes getting calcium, albumin, or just an ionized calcium, as well as the parathyroid hormone. And you want to get these at the same time so that you can get a, a picture of uh, a moment in time what's happening with the calcium and the parathyroid. Because they're always uh, feeding off one another, so getting them separately isn't helpful. Uh, also, um, vitamin D, 25-OH vitamin D, 24-hour uh, urinary calcium, uh, and creatinine. Importantly, when we're uh, working at primary hyperparathyroidism, we need to rule out uh, malignancy that could be causing hypercalcemia. So, again, that's why you always want to get your parathyroid hormone as well. Um, FHH, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, is this is not treated with an operation. That's why you get the 24-hour urinary calcium levels. And if they're low, you may want to refer for uh, workup of FHH. And also, importantly, we want to rule out secondary hyperparathyroidism. So we want to check the vitamin D levels as well as work them or evaluate for NC renal disease. Since this is also secondary, is not um, readily treated with an operation. In the workup, we also evaluate the bone density, so we like to have the patients get a, a DEXA scan. And then, as we mentioned with thyroid, you always have to get a full family history, especially to look out for the syndromes MEN1 and 2A. So once we've done our biochemical diagnosis, then we've confirmed that they have the disease. The next question is to ask whether they have an indication for surgery. So the, uh, the workshop indications include uh, symptomatic versus asymptomatic disease. You only need one indication of the following. So symptomatic includes kidney stones, uh, really severe osteoporosis called osteitis fibrosis cystica, and hypercalcemic crisis where you present with severely elevated calcium levels, leading uh, resuscitation and diuresis. Asymptomatic. Uh, there's a long list, um, calcium greater than 1 above the upper limit of normal. So if the upper limit of normal is 10.2, for example, a calcium of 11.2 would fit this criteria. Age less than 50, bone manifestations, including osteoporosis, or incidentally found vertebral compression fractures, and renal manifestations. So incidentally noted, kidney stones, uh, urinary calcium is really high, greater than 400 over 24 hours, as well as an impaired uh, GFR. So once we've completed our biochemical diagnosis and we have found an indication for surgery, we have decided to take them to surgery. Only then do you start uh, considering imaging. Imaging does not play a role in making the diagnosis of this disease. You only use it to guide your operation and use it as a roadmap. So our options include ultrasound. Um, everybody going for parathyroid surgery needs to get an ultrasound. Um, you may 
may not see uh, parathyroid on the ultrasound. It's often operator dependent. So if a surgeon performs a, a parathyroid ultrasound, though, um, or a neck ultrasound looking for a parathyroid adenoma, the sensitivity and specificity goes up. Um, the other reason to get an ultrasound is to rule out thyroid nodules. So about 20% of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism will have thyroid disease as well. So you definitely want to know if they have any thyroid nodules that potentially may need uh, biopsy prior to proceeding with surgery so that you can deal with the thyroid at the same time if it's necessary. You also uh, may have, which I'll discuss uh, in a few slides, an intrathyroidal parathyroid gland, which would be helpful to know uh, on an ultrasound. Uh, a Sestamibi scan, um, which is shown in the middle here, um, is a functional scan um, taken up uh, by the thyroid and the salivary glands, as you can see in the picture on the left in the middle. And then you get a washout after two hours, and it should have uh, dissipated from the thyroid, and it uh, retains inside the parathyroid adenoma. This test has a, a pretty low sensitivity, but a high specificity. And uh, finally, a 40-CT, um, which is available at uh, many institutions now, um, the fourth dimension is time, so essentially when you see the scanner, an extra time compared to a typical CAT scan. Um, uh, this is probably the most sensitive test uh, that we have, um, and it also uh, can demonstrate normal parathyroid glands as well, which um, is almost impossible to see on any of the other imaging modalities. So typically, um, you want to get an ultrasound plus a sestamibi if you're going to get a sestamibi, or an ultrasound plus a 40 CT. Uh, if we do an ultrasound and a sestamibi, and they both are important in terms of the localization of the diseased gland, that's about a 96% sensitivity and 95% accuracy. When we talk about parathyroid surgery, there's largely two approaches. The gold standard is the bilateral exploration. Um, and this is where you look at all four parathyroid glands. Um, this is obviously what was done uh, when parathyroid surgery began and before our imaging uh, was really good at finding disease parathyroid glands. Um, and then uh, the other approach is a focused exploration. So with this, if you have uh, imaging that demonstrates um, a disease gland or localizes um, to uh, a quadrant in the neck, um, you can proceed with just going after that one gland, resecting it, and then uh, your check is to get intraoperative parathyroid hormone levels. So we use um, the IOPTH monitoring always for a focus exploration. And uh, we want to satisfy the Miami criterion, which is a greater than 50% drop in the parathyroid hormone level at 10 minutes. And we measure a baseline, uh, time zero, which is at the time that you're taking the disease parathyroid gland, and then five minutes after that and 10 minutes after that. And again, if you see uh, a greater than 50% drop in the parathyroid hormone level, then you can stop the operation. If you do not have that drop in parathyroid hormone, then you have to proceed with a bilateral exploration. Oftentimes with the bilateral exploration, uh, we'll still get uh, intraoperative parathyroid hormone. We'll still use that monitoring, but it's not uh, absolutely necessary as it is with a focus exploration. Other procedures we may do with parathyroid surgery include uh, auto transplantation. So, uh, if you your parathyroid hormone drops down too low, um, or you instantly take out a normal parathyroid gland, um, you can auto transplant it. Um, we use the brachial radialis in the forearm um, as our location, and the reason we use the forearm is because if you're operating on parathyroid disease, you want to put the gland, even if it appears 
appears normal, um, you want to put it in an area where it's going to be easily accessible to you if they have recurrence. So if you put it in the strap muscle of the sternocleidomastoid, then that means you're going to have to go back into the neck to uh, resect out any disease if you have a recurrence. So we will um, use the brachial radialis in the forearm if we have to do an autotransplantation of uh, parathyroid or parathyroid disease. If you incidentally take out uh, a normal parathyroid during a thyroid surgery, that's when you can consider putting it in, and most you would uh, put it in the strap muscle or sternocleidomastoid, as you have very low suspicion that that gland is ever going to become diseased and you're going to have to go resect it. You can also do parathyroid cryopreservation, sort of like an insurance policy where you uh, cryopreserve um, the parathyroid tissue and then if down the line they ever end up needing more parathyroid tissue um, because they're permanently hypoparathyroid, you can thaw out uh, that tissue and um, perform a lot of transplants. And when we talk about um, parathyroid uh, locations, typically uh, the superior parathyroids are located posterior to the recurrent origin and uh, the inferior parathyroid glands are located anterior to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. We also can have ectopically located glands. Um, the uh, tracheoesophageal groove is the most common place for an ectopic upper parathyroid gland, and the thymus is the most common place for a lower parathyroid gland. Um, other places that they can hide include the carotid sheath, intrathyroidal, as I mentioned, uh, the posterior pharyngeal space, the salivary glands, uh, and the mediastinum. Uh, also, about 5% of patients have a fifth gland, uh, so most um, will be located in the thymus if they have a supernumerary gland. The special populations to consider patients with four current hyperplasia, you want to do a three and a half gland parathyroidectomy, leaving behind half of an abnormal gland, which is the equivalent of one normal gland. For patients with tertiary hypoparathyroidism, you want to do a three or three and a half gland parathyroidectomy with a bilateral thymectomy. That's in case they have a supernumerary gland. Plus or minus an autotransplantation or cryopreservation. For MEN1 patients, their form of disease tends to be highly virulent and very, very, very high risk of recurrence, almost guaranteed, especially if they're diagnosed younger. For these patients, you want to do a three and a half gland parathyroidectomy with a bilateral thymectomy. Patients with MEN2A tend to have more mild disease, uh, and you can be more conservative for these patients compared to the MEN1 patients. Um, or um, you can do a bilateral exploration if you're doing a concomitant thyroidectomy for measuring thyroid cancer associated with MEN2A, um, if they've already had a thyroidectomy for medullary thyroid cancer uh, and or for prophylaxis, if they may have MEN2A, uh, and you're talking about going into a reoperative neck, uh, this is an appropriate time to do a focused exploration um, because you risk devascularizing normal glands uh, if you do a bilateral exploration in the reoperative neck. So oftentimes, if these patients, again, have had a prophylactic thyroidectomy and they develop parathyroid disease later on in life, uh, then you can localize the disease gland on imaging and do a focused exploration. Uh, surgical cure after a parathyroid surgery is demonstrated by normalization of calcium at six months. Finally, we'll talk about the adrenal. So the anatomy of the adrenal is important to understand the disease and the types of diseases that develop. Um, so obviously there's the cortex and the medulla inside and uh, the cortex has three layers, uh, the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. 
And this table essentially um, should try to commit to memory. Um, it breaks down each of the zones and what hormone is produced there, what function that has. We'll kind of go through um, each one of those in a little more detail. Aldosterone um, or primary hyperaldosterone is constant. Sometimes uh, patients present with refractory hypertension, so they are multiple agents and have still um, significant hypertension. Um, they also notably have hypokalemia. The etiology, um, uh, importantly, with this disease, um, up to 50% can be due to hyperplasia rather than an adenoma. The labs that you want to get to evaluate are aldosterone and renin. And then you want to do a ratio of the uh, aldosterone, the plasma aldosterone concentration to the plasma renin activity. And you want this ratio uh, to be over 20 to 30 um, in order to confirm the diagnosis. Oftentimes, we'll also see um, the aldosterone is greater than 15. The renin tends to be less than one. And again, they have significant hypothalamia. You can also perform that saline loading test. Imaging, um, we start with a CT. Um, but it's important to remember that the CT scan uh, in this disease can lead to mismanagement. So one study uh, demonstrated that up to 50% of cases may be mismanaged if a CT is performed alone. So to break that down a little bit, 9% um, of patients with an adrenal mass on CT actually lateralized to the opposite side when using adrenal vein sampling. So if you went in to take that adrenal mass, you would not have cured them with their disease. They both going to the opposite side. 11% of patients with an adrenal mass did not lateralize um, at all. So the mass that they saw on the CT is not functional, and they actually have bilateral disease. And then 80% of patients with bilateral disease on CT actually lateralize with vein sampling. So selective vein sampling is, or adrenal vein sampling, is uh, an important part of the workup here. Many will get selective vein sampling for all cases of primary hyperaldosteronism. As uh, mentioned before, and CT alone can be misleading. You definitely want to get uh, selective vein sampling for patients who are over 40 years of age, since the risk of having a non-functional adrenal mass, incidentally noted, uh, goes up as you age. So definitely if they're over 40 years of age, but most often these days um, we will get uh, selective vein sampling in all cases. So in this procedure, we essentially draw the aldosterone and cortisol from both adrenal veins. Uh, the cortisol serves as a control um, and compare them. So in this procedure, the first step is to cannulate. Uh, so you compare the aldosterone and cortisol ratios from each adrenal and compare them to the IVC to ensure cannulization. And only if you cannulate can you move on to step two, which is lateralization. Uh, so in this step, you compare the aldosterone to cortisol ratio from one side to the other. And if the gradient is above four or five, then you have successfully cannulated and localized to whichever side. If you fail to cannulate, this is almost always uh, occurring on the right side. And the reason for that is because the right adrenal vein is shorter and it comes uh, off, comes into the IVC at an abrupt right angle. So it can be very difficult to cannulate the right side. Um, the left adrenal vein, uh, on the other hand, drains into the left renal vein, which then goes into the IVC. So the pathway is a little more straightforward to cannulate. And for the 
this disease uh, if the vein sampling lateralizes and confirms unilateral disease, uh, surgery is indicated um, either for an adenoma or for a unilateral hyperplasia. And uh, bilateral hyperaldosteronism uh, is treated with spironolactone and vaccine supplements. Cushing syndrome uh, is um, clinically manifest as hypertension uh, central or truncal obesity, easy bruising, muscle weakness, uh, presence of a dorsal fat pad. Um, the etiology in general of steroid excess um, includes Cushing's disease, which is the ACTH producing pituitary mass. Um, always remember Cushing's disease is from the pituitary, uh, and Cushing's syndrome is everything else. Um, the most common cause of excess steroid is uh, actual pharmacological uh, use. And then about 90% of adrenal cushions is secondary to an adenoma. Uh, there's also ectopic ACTH syndrome as well as small cell lung cancer that can cause elevated uh, cortisol levels. The lab workup includes 24-hour uh, urinary cortisol. This is best for confirmation of the disease. Um, a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test is best for screening. So with this test, you take um, one milligram of dexamethasone um, at 11 p.m., and then the next morning by 8 a.m., you want to measure uh, cortisol level and dexamethasone level. Uh, the dexamethasone level is just to confirm that they actually did take the pill. And you'll want uh, your morning cortisol level to be uh, less than 1.8 is normal, um, and greater than 5 is um, diagnostic of Cushing's. Um, and between those two uh, is where you consider potential subclinical Cushing's. Uh, high dose dexamethasone suppression test um, is indicated if you suspect. ACTH dependent disease such as a pituitary or ectopic. And um, imaging that you want to get as a CT for localization. And um, surgery is uh, indicated for um, uh, adrenal Cushing syndrome. Uh, the considerations perioperatively are that you'll want to give stress dose steroids uh, in the operating room. And um, one thing always to consider is that if the patient presents with rapidly progressive Cushing disease, you always want to suspect uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, and this is especially notable in children. So um, uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma is the most common cause of a child presenting with Cushing. So 90% of kids um, with this will present with realization and you want to treat with surgery and might attain. For virilizing and feminizing tumors, um, these are rare. Most of them are virilizing. Most feminizing tumors are malignant. Um, labs include 24-hour urinary testosterone as well as DHEA and DHEAS. Theoclonocytoma clinically presents um, with hypertension. This can be either episodic or sustained. Um, patients report having palpitations, sledding, tachycardia. Um, oftentimes, these patients uh, feel like they're having significant anxiety or panic attacks, and they can be um, confused uh, with the presentation of a theoclonocytoma. Um, this is classically the rule of tens, um, although this is has been um, on out of favor, but testing-wise, uh, the 10% are bilateral, 10% are malignant, 10% are extra-adrenal. Lab work for pheochromocytoma include um, plasma metanephrine. Uh, this is the most sensitive test, best for screening. Again, this is plasma metanephrine, not catecholamine. And then urine metanephrines are more specific, and these are, uh, this test is best for confirmation. The imaging, um, you can get a CT for localization. Um, you can also get an MIBG if you suspect multifocal disease. Um, these are, uh, this test is specific, but not as 
sensitive. Um, and then uh, for uh, metastatic disease, you can get an FDG PET or a DOTATATE scan. Those are more sensitive for metastatic disease. Um, also, uh, MIBG or PET or DOTATATE for uh, workup of paraganglioma. Uh, these uh, tumors you will want to resect. Uh, notably, uh, you have to uh, do some work up front, including preoperative alpha blockade and volume depletion. So you can uh, add a, bet, a beta blocker as well for tachycardia, but only uh, if the alpha blocker is already on board. We want to um, make sure that these patients are adequately alpha blocked um, and well hydrated uh, prior to going into the operating room. Um, just to mitigate the significant intraoperative hemodynamic changes that occur. And uh, adrenocortical carcinoma, um, so the, this disease um, is high risk for a local recurrence um, even after surgical resection. Um, over 50% are hormonally active. The most common is Cushing's, um, and the second most common is virilization or virilizing tumors. Um, the unfortunately very um, poor prognosis, five-year survival, only 15 to 20 percent, um, but is a little higher if you get um, uh, your surgical resection. Um, clinically, um, oftentimes these tumors are big at the time of diagnosis, um, even greater than 10 centimeters. Um, patients may present with a rarely pain, oftentimes um, a fullness. Uh, in, in the abdomen and then undergo a CT scan and they have a huge um, ACC. The treatment um, is uh, open adrenalectomy and uh, you can also give mitotene for advanced disease. So uh, adrenal incidentaloma is by definition uh, an adrenal mass that you encounter when looking for something else. Um, so they have uh, incidentally noted uh, adrenal tumor on a CT scan or MRI that was done for another reason. These are present in 7% uh, of patients that are greater than 70 years of age, only in about 1% of patients 30 years of age. So going along with the concept that uh, you're more likely to develop uh, these incidental lomas um, as you get older. And um, the workup for these are to rule out uh, functional disease first. Um, so you always have to do uh, your workup for hyperaldosteronism, workup for Cushing's, workup for pheochromocytoma, and of course for um, uh, the virilizing uh, and feminizing tumors as well. If the functional workup is negative, uh, and you're dealing with a non-functional incidentaloma, then the question um, is about how big it is and what it looks like on imaging. So essentially, size correlates with the risk of malignancy. The larger the tumor is, the more likely it is to be cancer. So we have specific cutoffs. Anything greater than six centimeters has about a 25% risk of being ACC. Anything four to six centimeters has about a 6% risk of ACC. And anything less than four centimeters has about a 2% risk of ACC. So that's why we recommend uh, for non-functional adrenal xenoma, if it measures four to six centimeters, that risk has gone from two up to 6%, and that's an indication for an operation. The imaging characteristics are important. Um, Hounds units. Uh, that are less than 10 um, is uh, correlated with a benign uh, mass. Um, if there's a six, greater than 60% washout, that's also a benign finding. Um, also, irregular borders, clearly, if there's any obvious invasion into any other structures or into the IVC, those are concerning findings. You always want to consider the age of the patient um, and uh, the rate of growth of the mass if you have multiple time points. And then you also have to uh, ensure that the patient has age-appropriate screening to rule out metastases to the adrenal. So um, 
RCC uh, is one of the common ones, melanoma, lung cancer, um, can all metastasize to the adrenal. Um, this is the only potential role for an FNA of the um, adrenal. Otherwise, we never um, biopsy the adrenal prior to an uh, operative resection, um, especially if they have a field for mesotoma. So if you are going to perform an FNA in the case of your concern for uh, metastases, you have to ensure that you've gotten your uh, plasma and FMs prior. Um, and then also um, of note, uh, in terms of ruling out functional disease, um, you always want to make sure that you get at least uh, the lab work for uh, pheochromocytoma and pushings prior to resection. Um, Hyperaldosteronism, uh, you can um, leave that out if the patient has no history of hypertension, but certainly if they do, you want to look for that as well. Here is this table again. Now, uh, with the last column added, the lab work, um, and these are all the labs that you'd want to get uh, to work up these diseases. There are several approaches to removing the adrenal glands. Uh, laparoscopic transabdominal, uh, that's with the patient in the lateral decubitus position, where you go in anteriorly. Uh, the retroperitoneal posterior approach, um, this is done through the back, so the patient is prone, and you make three incisions just underneath the rib cage uh, and use um, your laparoscopic equipment to uh, remove the adrenal that way. Um, this approach is uh, very favorable uh, because it is the most direct approach to the adrenal gland, as you don't have to mobilize either the liver or the spleen, uh, pancreas, colon out of the way. Um, and so uh, the approach is much more direct. Um, however, the view is much less familiar as you're coming from the back. Um, and so there is a significant learning curve to learning this approach. Open, uh, we always do for any adrenal cortical carcinoma, or if you suspect adrenal cortical carcinoma, so if you have a tumor that's greater than six centimeters, uh, you want to do that open. And the reason for that is because you want to give them the best chance of surgical cure uh, the first time around um, by doing a, a complete resection of the tumor. That wraps up the endocrine section. I'm happy to take any questions at this point, and I wish you all the best of luck.